from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. We're on the road from the 2020 National Farm Machinery Show right here in Louisville, Kentucky. And here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. As coronavirus spreads, fresh fears of the economic bite. We don't know when this coronavirus will be corralled and we don't know how long it will go on. But can the virus be contained? And the phase one trade promises from China saved. USDA releasing a WASDE report with not a lot of buzz, but the biggest shock may be how massive of a crop Brazil could harvest this year. With machinery on display here at the Farm Machinery Show, Machinery Pete discusses the top equipment trends he's seen in 2020. The well, use equipment values have been actually really uh, strong since the end of 19. And in John's world, are we really paving over America's farmland? Each year, U.S. Farm Report hits the road for the National Farm Machinery Show, a staple every February in Louisville, Kentucky, since 1966. With thousands of square feet of exhibitor space, the show draws in more than 300,000 people each year. The pinnacle event, the championship tractor pool. We'll have more from this show, including finding the machinery Pete later. But first, for the news, the number of coronavirus cases in China continues to grow, and those cases may be worse than originally thought. The number of cases in China seen a significant jump with 15,000 new infections. Health experts are accusing China of inadequate testing as medical facilities are just overwhelmed. Officials now say tests in China only detected 20 to 30 percent of cases correctly at that time. While the official count is growing, some companies are continuing to tell employees to work from home. Others are keeping factories closed. The outbreak sending food prices in the country soaring with price inflation hitting 5.4 percent in January. The price of pork has more than doubled from a year ago, up 116 percent. Vegetables are up 17 percent. Well, the phase one trade deal with China officially goes into effect this weekend, but China's Commerce Ministry acknowledging it may need to delay purchases because of the coronavirus while still vowing to meet its commitments. In a recent phone call, President Trump and China's President Xi Jinping, quote, agreed to continue extensive communication and cooperation between both sides, end quote. White House advisor Larry Kudlow telling Bloomberg Television that Xi told President Trump the country would still meet its purchasing targets agreed to as part of the trade deal despite coronavirus, with President Trump expressing confidence in China's strength and resilience in confronting that challenge. China announcing last week it will cut $75 billion in tariffs, and that includes some tariffs on soybeans and pork. Well, USDA released its latest estimates this week, and many were wondering how WASDE would account for the phase one trade agreement in its February report. Starting with corn, USDA leaving the outlook little changed from January, saying exports were lowered 50 million bushels due to the slow pace of shipments. But there's a 50 million bushel increase in corn used for ethanol, ending stocks matching January. With soybeans, the USDA is calling for increased exports and lower ending stocks. It's projecting an increase in exports over last month because of China. Ending stocks are 425 million bushels. That's lower than trade estimates and 50 million bushels fewer than January. Agritalk's Chip Flory says right now it really all comes down to price. We're sitting at 425 million bushels. Sounds like good news, right? I mean, we didn't change the supply. We increased our total use by 50 million bushels, and that was the incentive for the World Board to take 25 cents off the expected national average on-farm cash price for soybeans, which is now down at 8.75. And the outlook for U.S. wheat is for stable supplies, increased exports, and decreased ending stocks. Ending stocks at 940 million bushels. That's down 25 million bushels from January and just below trade estimates. News out of Kentucky this week hitting headlines. A large hemp processor going bankrupt. Kentucky's Agriculture Commissioner says the bankruptcy filing by Jen Canna as the state's leading hemp processor is a gut punch to the industry. Jen Canna says the move will allow reorganization of debt and continue operations without any interruption. Commissioner Ryan Corral says this is a sign the national hemp industry is facing some strong headwinds. All right, that's it for the news. Well, more rain and snow this week and a shot of brutally cold air. We'll have a check of weather with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. That's next. Let the proven performance of Presaro fungicide maximize your grain quality, yield, and profit this season. Time now 
for a check of weather with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, driving from Missouri to Kentucky this week, I could not believe the amount of water standing in fields. This is beginning to feel a lot like a repeat of last year. Well, thanks, Tyne. Yeah, I'm a little worried about that too, uh, especially when we're very wet already. You can see most of the middle of the country, a lot of the growing regions, the major growing regions of our country are wet. All the blue areas are very wet, as a matter of fact. This is wetter than last year at this time. However, I'm not convinced that we have the same type of spring this year. I'm hopeful that we don't, uh, and there are signs that we won't. But, uh, you know, that's something that we kind of have to wait and see at this point. We are going to see the wintry pattern that we've suddenly gotten into in the Midwest and the East kind of linger for a while. Now you can see root zone uh, on the dry side, farther west, four corner region, Back into California, actually the California area, that's where drought has suddenly shown up just in the last couple of weeks. We're seeing moderate drought for the central and southern portions of the valley there. We continue to see the drought for corner region into southwestern Kansas and eastern and southern Texas seeing the drought areas. Every place else it's really kind of improved as far as the drought is concerned. And like we pointed out, it's too wet in many parts of the middle in eastern parts of the country. All right, let's look at the overall weather pattern right now. We've gone into a more wintry weather pattern for the northern tier of states and on eastward with each one of these troughs coming in. There's a small one moving through the Great Lakes uh, as we uh, move through the end of the weekend here. A little stronger one diving into the uh, northern Mississippi Valley and eventually Great Lakes in the northeast as we head through the middle of the country. That's a pretty strong storm system moving there. Anytime you see the cutoff off of California, that is concerning because you kind of get moisture riding up out of the Pacific to add to all the moisture already coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. So hopefully that doesn't stick around too long. But there's Friday, another trough moving into the northern portions of the country, and that will move on southeastward as well. Each one of these will bring a quick shot of colder air, but what that doesn't do is bring cold air that comes and stays. So we see things kind of, you know, just revolving uh, every, every three or four days. So we have a storm system gathering its strength on Monday with some snow uh, flying through parts of the northern plains, western lakes, a few showers in other places. This becomes a pretty potent storm through the middle of the country. But by Wednesday, that's already off the east coast. A few lingering snow showers in the northeast and the Great Lakes. And then some scattered rain showers behind the cold front that's all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. By Friday then, another storm system coming across the country. A couple areas of low pressure with a little bit of rain and snow there. But high pressure dominating the east coast and southern Texas. 30-day uh, outlook below normal temperatures for most of the central and northern plains. Central and northern Rockies as well. Above normal from Louisiana to southern New England, all the way to Florida. And in precipitation over the next 30 days, that battleground area between the cold and the warm will be the above normal area of moisture, as well as parts of the Rockies below normal northern plains and much of California and Nevada. Tyne? Thanks, Mike. Well, with a wet forecast and all the water standing in fields, is 95 million acres of corn possible? What about 100 million acres? Our marketing roundtables are next with Bill Biederman, Joe Baklovic, and Alan Hoskins. U.S. Farm Report on the road at the National Farm Machinery Show is brought to you by Kubota. Together we do more. Learn more at KubotaUSA.com. And by Great Plains, harvest starts here on the web at greatplainsag.com. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report from here at the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville, Kentucky. A lot of news this week, a lot of buzz this week, Bill, about coronavirus. I mean, Thursday, we woke up to the fact that all of a sudden China found 15,000 new cases based on maybe they were not uh, vetting that process very well. And so the, the, the cases are worse than we thought. How did the markets respond to that news, Bill? Well, there was a lot of disinformation. They didn't find 15,000 new cases overnight. They revised how they're accounting for it. So, you know, these cases were there. But the point being is they're trying to be transparent, and that's a good thing. Um, the coronavirus is a very serious problem. And back when uh, Reagan was, was president, I was able to be on a, um, a, an advisory panel with, with the USDA, and I was at a meeting where they showed a virus problem, uh, potential, and they simulated it. And the real problem isn't the contagion and it's not the death rate. The real problem is a lack of transportation. If all the truckers said, I'm not coming to Louisville, I don't want to bring that virus back to my family, 
grocery stores in the United States run out of food in three days. The homes will run out of food in 14 days. I don't know what it's like in China, but that is the risk. And it sounds like, Joe, partially that is what we're seeing in some areas over there. We're seeing them deplete some of those food stocks and, and, and freezers. So do you think at some point that does create an opportunity for U.S. products like meats? Well, I, I think when you go back to the trade deal part of it, I, I have thought the whole time that the protein sector, your pork, your beef, uh, poultry out of the U.S., those were probably your best candidates for big increases in, in regard to Chinese purchases. Um, soybeans would be the obvious one, but, but there's a lot of problems with that, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. So yeah, I, I think it, it does open the door potentially to uh, increased exports of, of meat products in particular. But Bill, this week, we heard China acknowledge that it could delay some of the promises. I mean, we're seeing this phase one trade deal go into effect this weekend. And now we're hearing it could delay some of those purchases. Do you think that's baked into the market? I mean, did the market understand that, that when this, this virus came and it spread like it did, that we would see it impact what China buys in the near term? Yeah, I do think that the market was trying to discount some backing away by China and giving China some relief on that whole idea of, well, you've got to buy now. The market doesn't know when they're going to buy. When they do start buying, it'll probably be was it just a one and done thing or by, you know, when Russia came in and did the great grain robbery, it, it was about the third purchase they made when the market exploded and never looked back. Remember, there's, there's not going to be a point at any time in the next probably six months at which U.S. soybeans will be competitive versus Brazil. Brazil and Argentina are going to have a combined record crop. They've got a massive currency advantage. They've got a freight advantage, a massive freight advantage on any soybean shipped from Brazil to China versus the U.S. to China. So China's told us repeatedly they don't want to buy non-competitive products. We will not be competitive in beans until, probably until we get into harvest this fall. That's, that's the fact of the matter. Alan, you know, coronavirus seems like one of these black swan events. No one saw this coming. I mean, no one thought that we were going to have a new year hit and this would happen. But the impact that it's having on what China buys, the impact it's have on our markets, I mean, it's, it, it's frustrating. How do you make a plan, a game plan, in a year like this when now you, you're already hit with something that you never thought was possible? Well, I think this year is no different than any other year in one respect. There is no year that is predictable. We know going into it that there are going to be ups and downs in the market. That's a given. If producers understand their cost of production and they look at where the markets are and they work a written marketing plan, it allows them to ignore some of the outside noise, stay focused on what their plans are, and we understand that when you develop a marketing plan, it's going to change over the course of the year. It has to. The markets are going to move. So, yes, this is the black swan event that we certainly didn't anticipate. But candidly, going into it every year, there are unexpected. It's really no different. Maybe we could, could predict that this was going to happen. But one thing we can predict is Brazil looks like they have a big crop on their hands, Bill. Are you fearful that we do have a record crop come out of Brazil and maybe if we do have decent weather, we have another big crop here, what it could do on the markets and what pressure it could provide? Yeah, I was really concerned about that <clears throat> earlier this, uh, this year about where we could be in the fall. And, and you know, basic economic studies say 325. It's very possible. But <clears throat> the more we're looking at things now, uh, you know, we don't know if South America is going to get their corn second crop planted on time. We have no idea what's going to happen here in the United States. I mean, obviously there's, you know, issues right now, but it's a long time before planting. So I think there's just too many unknowns, but I do think the market is, is factoring in a lot of acres here and a big crop there. Yeah, so 95 million, 100 million acres. I mean, what is possible? We'll ask Joe Vakladik in our next roundtable here on U.S. Farm Report. Well, each year, National Farm Machinery Show rows and rows of equipment and technologies on display on what you can utilize on the land. But on John's mind this weekend, land availability. Ag media have a few topics that never seem to go out of fashion. One is, we're paving over farmland. While this is technically true, I think it's way overblown. Consider this headline. 31 million acres lost. Development cuts into U.S. farmland. Now, like many farmers, one number I have vaguely memorized is corn and soybean planted acres, which is around 90 million acres each. So in that context, the number 31 looks huge. However, 
it's over 20 years, 92 to 12. Second, it seems only 11 million was prime farmland. So we're really talking about a half million acres per year lost. Even with this clarification, these perennial scare pieces border on unhelpful for several reasons. Much of the land being developed is high value simply because it is next door to a suburb. You really can't tell much about the agricultural quality from the price because it's determined by location, not production. Second, look at this chart of planted acres to the major crops over the last 90 years, courtesy of Purdue economist Jason Lusk. He has a great blog, by the way. Not only is it roughly constant, it's hard to pick up any decrease in the last few decades. Now, crop acres can be converted from pasture and rangeland, of course, but there's no evidence that we are running out of places to plant major crops. In fact, I think we're just one good growing season away from the very real possibility of land idling farm programs. Keep in mind that all the developed land in the United States, the urban land, if you would, would fit inside Wisconsin. It totals about 70 million acres out of our land area of 2.25 billion acres, or 3%. Besides, if we should ever need more land for food, all we have to do is end the ethanol mandate. These sensationalist headlines ignore two crucial problems, the affordable housing crisis in the U.S., and the rights of landowners. While I agree that better economic and social policy would be to reform housing regulations to densify urban areas, that battle should be addressed directly, not by land control around the edges that threatens the rights of landowners to sell at their discretion. Such efforts have proven ineffective anyway. The U.S. has a significant farmland loss problem from erosion, but America does not and never has had a farmland loss problem from development. This issue is really about ineffective housing and transportation policy. Thanks, John. Well, we can't go to the National Farm Machinery Show and not find machinery. Pete we will track him down for tractor tails next. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for only on MachineRepeat.com. Well, it was no easy task, but I found him. Machinery Pete, you are a popular man at this show. Uh, always fun to walk the show, see the new equipment, talk used, uh, big fun. Speaking of used, this is a pretty machine right behind us. Oh tractor gosh. from the 1970s, a blast from the past. But a couple weeks ago, we had a Lamborghini tractor, and I'm telling you, Greg, I can get behind that. I can get interested in antique tractors if it's going to be more of those. I think you should own a Lamborghini. That'd be perfect. I agree. James, did you hear that? What's, <laughs> what's on tap this week, though? Uh, this week, folks, we're heading out to the state of Washington to check out a, a Porsche Master. We have a 1959 Porsche Master. And that's the largest model of the four models that Porsche uh, produced from 1938 to 1963. And this one uh, is one of 200 built of this particular model. We're estimating that there might be about 17 of these left. So they're very rare and very much sought after. Well, when I moved to Washington in 2000, I joined a tractor club up here. And I just happened to mention to the president of the club that I, think, I said, I think I'm going to look for a Porsche tractor because I'm a Porsche car owner. Well, he told me where the tractor was. Of course, I acquired that one, and then they started showing up because people knew I was looking. Yeah, this tractor happened to be in a uh, bird sanctuary. It was kind of a, I think it was used on a peat bog down in Kitsap County, which is about 80, uh, well, about 60 miles south of here. When they stopped harvesting the peat, they just left the tractor there. Of course, it became a waterway, and so the gentleman that I got it from, he and his sons were told about this tractor, and they decided they wanted it very badly. But the owner of the property said, this is a bird sanctuary, you're not allowed to use power equipment. So they used uh, come-alongs and cribbing. Some of the European tractors, uh, Porsche, as well as the Lamborghini, they're air-cooled diesels. They're not water-cooled. So as long as you keep the cylinders clean, they never overheat. They're very unique. These tractors had a um, 
viscous coupling so you could start the tractor in any gear. There was a belt pulley available for the front. The three-cylinder tractors had four PTOs. This particular tractor, the Germans didn't like it because it was a little large for them. They liked the three-cylinder and the two-cylinder the most. I take my grandkids in parades with me so they're able to sit. It's just fun to be the unique tractor owner that has something that nobody else has, and I really enjoy that. All right, well, we'll find Machinery Repeat again later in the show to talk about equipment trends and what you're focused on in 2020. But coming into 2020, one of those black swan events may have been coronavirus, and it seems like those cases continue to grow. We'll talk about the economic impact and if it could eat into China's demand next in our Farm Journal Report. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Welcome back. Well, each year at the National Farm Machinery Show, equipment companies are getting a pulse of interest and moods in the new year. But 2020 is off to an unexpected start. Coronavirus may be one of those black swans in the market, with economists and experts now questioning the impact it could have on the global economy. In this week's Farm Journal report, we take a look at the spread of the coronavirus and how it could potentially impact China's promise to buy $40 billion worth of U.S. ag goods this year. It's a virus that started blasting headlines last month, with the World Health Organization now calling it a grave threat. We don't know when this coronavirus will be corralled, and we don't know how long it will go on. New data from the National Health Commission shows signs of hope, the virus appearing to finally be slowing. But when it comes to the economic impact of the virus, the damage may already be done. Well, it's very difficult to say at this stage. Rabobank's Christian Lawrence says at this stage, the only comparison they have is SARS virus dating back to 2003 and the death toll from coronavirus already surpassing that. Then we did see a meaningful impact on, on global growth, but then China was only around about 4% of global GDP. China's now 16% of global GDP. So if the coronavirus gets a lot worse, and we start to see it really impact trade, really impact travel, then this could have a meaningful impact globally. Lawrence says if the spread of the virus slows, the economic story could quickly rebound. It really just depends on what happens with this virus going forward, and unfortunately, I just don't know. Uncertainty is overcoming the conversations among economists and analysts around the globe. I would say we haven't seen a slowdown outside of China, um, but it's probably a little early to tell. But the main concern right now is the heart of coronavirus outbreak, China. We could be probably two to four weeks away from finding out that it's a much bigger deal than it appears right now. And if that happens, then I think we have to be very concerned about it. The business travelers uh, around Asia are sit staying at home or not going um, on the road. So that's really gonna hurt, I think, economic growth in the first quarter. There's some talk of not 6% growth, but 3% growth, so half of what we would have expected. That's really going to slow what we would have seen in terms of trade flows. Earlier this week, Chinese officials said more than 1,100 people have died from coronavirus. But now health experts say the number of coronavirus cases in China is much higher than originally thought, as they say China's coronavirus testing is inadequate. This virus is spreading rapidly, and it is not being controlled adequately. So no matter how you do the counting, that's the bottom line. This is a really serious epidemic in China. This week, Chinese President Xi Jinping trying to calm fears, vowing to meet the economic goals while winning the battle against the deadly disease. That news coming as China's Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs acknowledged it may need to delay purchases agreed to in the phase one agreement with the U.S because of the virus. First of all, I'm not aware of their request for flexibility, although I'm not surprised. While some economists fear the spread of the disease could take its toll on ag exports, not everyone is completely sold on that idea. I think short term, the Chinese may even have a more acute need for agricultural products, particularly in the finished area like meats or those kind of products, because Chinese grocery stores are just being depleted at a very rapid rate. Think about a disease spreading, wearing masks. What you're going to do is protect the family by buying lots of food. So those pantries are getting filled and the Chinese government now has this problem of getting enough foodstuffs and supplies to restock the groceries. Ag Resource Company thinks the sectors that could reap the most benefit in that situation are the protein and meat sectors. But it's not just concerns about what China is buying, but also what China is exporting. 
We're expecting goods to arrive last week. So we were quite surprised to hear that the Chinese New Year had been extended by a week. And even more surprised to hear that the factory supplying materials to us was in the affected province and on shutdown without being able to give us a delivery date. While the global guessing game continues, USDA is analyzing how the virus could impact China's phase one promises. But USDA's Undersecretary Greg Ibaugh telling Farm Journal he's confident Chinese consumers will continue to consume food. I'm still very optimistic that China is going to have need for food, they're going to have demand for food, and that they should be able to fall within that 40 to 50 billion dollar per year expectation that the president has of them. No matter the outcome of how widespread coronavirus becomes, IBA says USDA is keeping tabs on what China buys or does not buy. We're monitoring the purchases that China is making. We're putting in the infrastructure at USDA because everything that leaves a U.S. port has a phytosanitary certificate that says which country it's going to. So we're setting up a system to be able to monitor China's purchases, to be able to gauge during what season they, we think they should be buying certain things. That information will then be reported back to the president. Whether it's fears of China not meeting their trade by promises or a disease that could eat away at global demand, coronavirus is sparking fresh fears in the new year. Well, it scares me. It should scare everybody. Uh, I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen. Well, one analyst thinks that coronavirus could actually be bullish for the protein sector. But what other factors are playing into the livestock markets in 2020? We'll have that when we come back on U.S. Farm Report. This segment is brought to you by the foundational partners of America's conservation ag movement, a diverse public-private partnership empowering farmers and ranchers in their conservation agriculture journey for resilient businesses, healthier ecosystems, and stronger communities. U.S. Farm Report on the road at the National Farm Machinery Show is brought to you by Kubota. Together we do more. Learn more at KubotaUSA.com. And by Great Plains. Harvest starts here on the web at GreatPlainsAg.com. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report here from the National Farm Machinery Show. Okay, Joe, I talked about it in the last roundtable. I was going to ask you, 95 million acres of corn this year, 100 million acres of corn in the U.S. I mean, what do you really think is possible? Um, I'm going to not answer the question, and I'm going to say that it doesn't really matter to you. It's not actionable. I could tell you what the number is right now if I knew it. If I could predict the future, I could, I could tell you the number. What would you do about it? Are you going to go sell all your 2020 corn crop because the acreage number is slightly bigger than uh, what people had expected? No, you're not going to do that. It's, it's just I, I've never tried to predict USDA reports, or put it this way, maybe in the past I had attempted to predict USDA reports <laughs> and never had any luck with it. And maybe there are people who are better at it than me, but even knowing these, these numbers in advance is not going to help you. It's not going to help you to make decisions. It, it really hasn't, not in my experience anyways. Um, that being said, 94 and a half, that's my number. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It, has, it doesn't matter what I think. It means it, it makes no lick of difference. Okay, well, I no longer care what you think, Bill. I want to know what you think. <laughs> I mean, if that is possible, we know last year some farmers pushed to plant corn, and that paid off. We saw some pretty decent yields even when the corn was planted late. So if we do push this corn crop, if we do push this number, if we do have a big acreage number and a decent yield, what should a farmer's game plan be at this point when it comes to marketing? Well, we're, we've been out speaking and doing a lot of budget analysis. And uh, like yesterday, I was in Des Moines. And right now, it was a live demonstration. The numbers that the crowd gave me, we could lock in $100 an acre profit right now. Today. Today. And we could keep, and that's using a conservative yield, and we could keep the upside about 60% open to the upside on our hedged grain, and we still had a pile of unhedged grain. Didn't matter where the market went, if you got hit by a train tomorrow, your wife would be safe, income would be good if, if nothing else happened, but if the market goes up, you'd really make a lot of money. Th those are the things that we need to be looking at right now, because it's unemotional. You're looking at profit, not price. Alan, you're, you're talking to a lot of producers right now. When you talk to farmers, do you have more that are thinking of switching, switching to, to more corn this year? We have heard that because of the lower input prices that we saw earlier. And yes, they're, candidly, people would rather grow corn. 
at least in the area that we're in, that is their preference to grow corn. But the key, as Bill said, it's looking at that and making sure that profit opportunity is locked in. Do you think, though, 2019 has a long tail? Like I said, we produced a pretty decent crop for some folks that got in really late. and You were in an area that had some prevent plant that pushed it past the insurance date. Do you think that's what fr is fresh in a producer's mind and we may push it a little too far? I think that that's certainly a possibility, but I'm going to contradict what I just said also. One of the things that's great about the American farmer is the resiliency. And yes, there were a lot of areas that came off some very challenging years. And candidly, we had some producers in our area that just scratched their head and said, how in the world could we grow the crop that we did? Look at when we planted. So yes, I think there's some lessons to be learned for 2019. But I think also most producers, at least that I've talked to, are basically saying, let's turn the page. Let's look at 2020. We don't know what it's going to be, but let's look at it as a normal year. Joe, looking at 2020, the livestock side, like I mentioned earlier, potentially hearing that we could see China demand more protein because mm. of this coronavirus. I mean, do you think that the story is brewing in a positive way when it comes to pork exports, beef exports, and how things are shaping up? I hope so. I, again, I, I believe that that's your best candidate among the agricultural products for a big surge in Chinese purchases. We've just seen a pretty nasty sell-off in the cattle market after what was really an extended rally. It, it was a rally that was what 35 percent off the lows I think in the course of three months so a correction was inevitable and we're in the midst of that correction right now but uh, bigger picture I think that uh, some of this China stuff could be supportive uh, I still have a lot of doubts about this trade deal if, if I had to make a bet today I would say there's no way that China buys 36 and a half billion dollars in ag goods before the end of the year I just don't see it Bill you agree with that Probably not. I'm pretty optimistic. I've been really? studying China for a long time. I hope you're right. I know, but it's in corn. I think the surprise will be in corn. I mean, in the last four years, they've gone from, from being a producer-consumer equal with zero nut change to stocks. In four years, they're consuming 20 million tons more than what they produce. Uh, the world stocks, uh, I mean, corn demand is through the roof. On a world basis, world stocks have gone from 351 million metric tons down to 297. That's a 50, 53, 54 million ton cut in four years. The problem is our foreign and trade policies have been so bad that we've been kicked out of the competitive arena. Now we're starting to turn that around. So I think the fact that China is a deficit consumer we could get some business out of that, and it could be really good. And their, their, hog, their whole hog industry in two years is going to be look different than it is now. All right. Well, thank you all for being here with us this week at National Farm Machinery Show. We really appreciate it. We need to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more U.S. Farm Report in just a minute. <laughs> Well, here at National Farm Machinery Show, it's always interesting to get a look of what's new and upcoming in the farm equipment business, but you can't appreciate the future without appreciating the past. And that's exactly what one school in Southern Missouri is doing. The museum uh, was kind of started as a, a passion of Mr. Gatz. He uh, inherited a lot of these tractors. A lot of people gave him tractors because he owned a tractor business. And so we have around 30 tractors and a lot of different implementation uh, implements here in uh, a lot of tractor seats, a lot of farm memorabilia, anything to do with farming we have here in the Tractor Museum. About 80% of them came to us completely unrestored. Uh, some of them came partially restored, and then uh, two or three of them came completely restored. These probably only cost $1,200 when they were bought brand new, and it, it was a different time, and kids can see that, and they see the, the amount of craftsmanship involved in putting these tractors together. The case tractor that we have that's over here behind me, it's one of the few examples of the original case emblem of Old Abe, which is the, the bald eagle, but it's the only representation we have of a case tractor here in the shop. So right here we have a John Deere B. It's a 1950 model, and it's actually a later model. And the reason I like this one, I like this tractor is, um, it has a six-speed transmission, which is only found on the mid to late models. And then it also has a pressed steel frame, uh, was also a later modification. We have had a few donated um, that were restored, but most have actually been restored um, by staff and students here at the college. Yeah, they completely um, disassemble the tractor, every nut and bolt. They break them down and um, go back through the motor and transmission to the paint and tires. We are next to a Challenge corn planter. To our knowledge, uh, the rest, uh, restore said this is one of two left in existence. 
Uh, this is the one that's the only one that's fully restored. It was right when the museum opened. This has always been a piece here in the museum. Uh, this is part of the first expansion and this was part of it. Most people don't know what it is. They can figure it out it's a planter, but they don't know what it is because there's a lot of other corn planters out there. Around 1890, 1900 is when this was built, which is surprising that there's not more left, but there's nobody can seem to find them or they were just throwaway pieces or something. They, we don't know. So it's a pretty neat piece. It's one of my favorites here. That's pretty neat. Well, when we come back, we've already talked a lot about China, but Sean Phipps has a take on an interesting export opportunity. That's next. What about selling duck and goose meat to China? Your call is very important to us. Please hold. Well, we've already talked a lot about China on this show this weekend, but could ducks be an area of opportunity when it comes to exports? Here's John Phipps. John Hokemuth, and I hope that's close, from Federalsburg, Maryland, has an interesting question. I thought they eat a lot of ducks in China. Are they on the list of things they're going to buy in the U.S.? Couldn't they use all we can provide? Just curious. Thanks for the question, John. This falls under that category of things I've never thought about before. After a little research, here's what I found. First of all, all the numbers I could gather lump duck and goose meat together. That's international figures. The phase one agreement does not mention this category other than a promise to modify existing phytosanitary standards on processed meat and poultry that were in practice not about food safety at all, but just protectionism. Now, as to consumption, you're right. China is by far the world's largest consumer of duck and goose meat. In 2018, the Chinese ate 5.5 million metric tons. The next largest market, France, consumed about 233,000 tons, or about 4% of China's. The third largest consumer is Myanmar at 174,000 tons. So yes, China is a huge market for that protein. Only China is also a huge producer as well, churning out, you guessed it, 5.5 million tons of the meat, allowing for a tiny bit for export. And the same goes for France and Myanmar. Basically, everybody eats their own ducks and geese. In fact, the entire world market for duck and goose meat is only about 300,000 tons. To compare, the U.S. produces less than 1% of China's output, about 50,000 tons. So it would be hard for us to seriously compete in China. Okay, we may, all of us now, be more informed on the duck and goose meat market than virtually all other Americans. If you can't win a bar bet with this nugget of trivia, you're not really trying. But it also illustrates one big fallacy, I think, in our collective view of China. While 1.4 billion people, a fifth of the world's population, can be an enormous and lucrative market, remember there are two formidable competitors. One, the Chinese themselves. If China could continue to modernize their agriculture, move people off farms, and achieve even tiny economies of scale, they will be able to satisfy more of their own domestic demand. Two, the other competitor is the rest of the world. They can do the math, too. With pressure like Australian beef and Hungarian duck and goose meat, yep, they're a player in that tiny market, we will have to earn our way in the Chinese and any other foreign market. Thanks, John. And remember, if you have a question or a comment for John, you can email him at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. All right, next up, to wrap up our show from National Farm Machinery Show, we'll revisit with Machinery Pete and look at what equipment trends he's watching in 2020, what's hot and what's not. That's with Machinery Pete next. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast all about production agriculture, brought to you by Pivot Bio Proven, the nitrogen-producing microbes that stay put whether or not. Visit pivotbio.com. Well, to round out the show this week from National Farm Machinery Show, Machinery Pete, it's been a while since we've caught up on used equipment values, but heading into 2020, it seems like producers are on this roller coaster of, of optimism. How are values holding up? Well, used equipment values have been actually really uh, strong since the end of 19. November, December closed out the year very strong. And actually, it's surprising to a ton of people time, but January, February, values on good used equipment are actually up a little bit. 
Do you think that sets the tone for the rest of 2020? Well, I think uh, farmers are responding to a little bit of good news, thankfully, with the trade agreements uh, and China, even if it hasn't shown up in the commodity markets yet, it seems like an attitude bump. And again, still, you know, the cost of new is what it is, so that option of a good used uh, piece of equipment, uh, there's a lot of, lot of interest in them out there. Okay, so what are you watching in 2020? What are you keeping an eye on, Greg? Well, uh, a couple things. Search traffic, which I found very interesting, to large horse tractors, planters, and combines was up big in fourth quarter. Uh, and now it's a little early for planters, but I think there's a lot of interest, again, in the retrofit on the U side. Oh, gosh, we posted a blog the other day on the new John Deere, the smaller planter. That went crazy. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in planting. But again, when I see search traffic be strong, that marries with what we're seeing on the auction market. So just watching to see how long that holds. Well, this week I've been watching these Valentine's Day boxes that are coming out. Yes. Greg, I've seen tractors. I've seen combines. There are some creative parents and kids out there. Those make me smile all the time. They blow up social media whenever we run across them. Ah, those Valentine's Day boxes, it's making me realize I need to up my game. Maybe maybe, maybe I'll do a combine next year. You should. And James we'll, will do a combine next year. We'll get that on come, machinery repeat. Ah, that'd be fun. Be awesome. Greg, it's always great to catch up. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Enjoy your time at National Farm Machinery Show, and thanks for taking the time just to dive into equipment values hey, with us. Bet. Always good to catch up with your time. Well, Greg, thank you so much. Wishing you the best in 2020. Well, from all of us at U.S. Farm Report and Machinery Repeat, Thank you for watching this weekend. Be sure to join us next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.